several stories. First is the story of a young seeker after enlightenment. He'd studied and practiced the various ways to enlightenment. He'd been with several spiritual masters. But then he heard that there was a great enlightened being who lived some distance away from him. So he sought to be in his presence, to learn what he could learn from him. So he set out on his way. He took with him his Indian mala beads. He wore his straw sandals, such as the Buddhists were said to wear. He carried a Tibetan begging bowl. He wore the shawl that was worn by the Kabbalists. But on the way, it so happened that a demon came by, invisible to the young man. But the demon decided that he would try to tempt the young man from his purpose. And he tried in various ways, but the young being was set and steadfast in his intentions. So they finally arrived at the abode of the said master. When they arrived, of course, the aura of purity and saintliness around the master's house was so great that the demon was unable to enter, so he had to remain outside. But the young seeker after enlightenment went in to the master's abode. But to his very great surprise, there was the master sitting on his cushion, smoking a cigarette, drinking a cup of coffee, reading the newspaper, and when anyone came in, he would pass the time of day with them quite casually. Well, the seeker after enlightenment was greatly, greatly shocked. And with every action this, this so-called master took, he ticked him off the list. This was not what a master did. But so, of course, he waited what he thought was the minimum of time he could courteously stay there. And then he farewelled the master and he left. But as he did, the master got up and followed him to the door because, of course, the master had been totally aware of the demon's presence all the time. So when the young seeker after enlightenment went out the door and the master followed him, the master turned to the demon and said, you need not have had any concerns at all. He always belonged to you. And then there's another story about a hermit who lived in a forest somewhere far away, living a very simple life in harmony with the animals and the birds that flew, eating the food of the land that was available to him. But as is the way with uh, these things, he'd gathered a number of followers who'd come to sit with him and learn the simple truths that he had to impart. Part of those simple truths were that one did not need any trappings to attain enlightenment. One didn't need to wear the robes or undertake all the rituals or the, uh, those ablutions and things that had become such a, uh, a habit outside. But amongst the group who gathered around the home, it was a young man who was in fact a merchant and he had occasion to travel to far distant places and one day when he was traveling buying wares to sell in his town
town, he was invited to a reception. And to his very great surprise, when he entered the reception hall, who should he see but the hermit, sitting amongst a group of people, wearing dreadlocks, having a mala around his neck, smelling highly of incense and all those things that one has. And he was absolutely shocked. But he waited, he waited until there was an opportune moment when the hermit was by himself and he went over and he approached them. He said, he said I'm, I'm, I'm greatly shocked. What, what, what are you doing here? And you tell us all of these things and none of these things are necessary. Look at you. Ah, said the hermit. But for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, they are ready to receive those lessons that allow one to move beyond the trappings of life. But there are those generally, who need the weird and wonderful to gain, gain their attention. And in this way, a little light can be lit, a little interest can be invoked in them. Then there's a final story about a merchant. He had occasion to travel to another place because there was someone who owed him a large sum of money and he wanted to reclaim this money. But it so happened that he had a most exquisitely beautiful concubine servant girl, so it called. He was absolutely smitten with her and she was so, so beautiful. He dared not leave her on her own. So he asked one of his dervish, pious dervish friends, because he himself was a follower of a certain Sufi sheikh, whether he would take care of this servant girl while he was away. Now this dervish, pious dervish man, we'll call him Hariri, well, it so happened that Hariri himself caught sight of this beautiful servant girl and himself was instantly smitten. But he was controlled enough to hold his emotions and his desires in place and immediately went to their Sufi sheikh to ask him about this. So when the pious Hariri went to the Sufi sheikh, we called him Ahmed. Ahmed said, go to Sheikh Yusuf. He will be able to help you. So Hariri immediately went off to see Sheikh Yusuf. But when he came to the place where Sheikh Yusuf lived, people said to him, Oh, you don't want to go to him. He's a heretic. A heretic. Don't go there. So Hariri went back to his Sufi sheikh and said, I've been told that Sheikh Yusuf is a heretic. No, 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 he said the Sufi sheikh. You go back to Sheikh Yusuf and ask him to. So Hariri went back and he came to the abode of Sheikh Yusuf. When he entered this opulent house of some magnificence, there was Sheikh Yusuf sitting on satin cushions smoking a hubble, hubble pipe, fondling a young man with a flagon of wine beside him book opened on his cushion, but Hariri kept his peace, and as he sat with Sheikh Yusuf, and Sheikh Yusuf began to speak, 
giving out spiritual words, Hariri went into a state of ecstasy. Now he'd noticed the aura of saintliness around Sheikh Yusuf, but those things that he saw with his eyes belied this awareness. But <clears throat> after being in his state of ecstasy, he asked Sheikh Yusuf, why do you live like this? Sheikh Yusuf said, it is so that men like you do not bring their beautiful servant girls to me to be taken care of. Let me put these three stories together. What is it? What is it that arises in us as an awareness? In other words, what do these stories evoke in you? a lot of judgment from the enlightened seekers and the spiritual work can be done on any level. Mm -hmm. yeah, there shouldn't be any judgment. Where are you placed now in relationship to the myriad of pathways, persuasions that are abounding in life now. What is there meaning for you? <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it, it makes me think um, truth is beyond, beyond forms and things can be done with attachment or with no attachment. So it's not what we do, but the, 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 the spirit that we do it with. Uh -huh. And what about the practices and the discipline? Ritual. It's a stage. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been contemplating exactly that. I've been listening to some very, very challenging material from Adi Ashanti, who's actually saying, well, isn't anything that we do coming from a need? to have a centre and the the centre is somehow we've, we've, we've actually got to get beyond the need to even be the meditator, to be the centre, to be the that which actually has whatever goes on bouncing off. I'm not putting it very well because I, I can't quite, I'm only just grasping at the edges of it myself and so yeah, that, and that 
the spiritual refinement is possibly the greatest illusion of all. Mm -hmm. And as we let go of forms that appear to us gross and obvious, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's obviously not spiritual. Yes. <laughs> Sitting here on a Tuesday morning obviously is. <laughs> so, you know, so as, as we start to let go of the obvious ones, then the subtle ones come in and out and, mm -hmm. and and our ego or our sense of self or our sense of centre that actually needs identity uh, has to find more refined ways of tricking us. Yes. <laughs> 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 ah, very so, well put. Very well put, And And to, to let go of everything is... <laughs> 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 We just always want to grasp onto something yes. and, and think that things should be this way or that way or, and just to go into that nothing of no, no, even no intention, no yes. anything is really, I'm finding really challenging. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm. And it's really easy to get caught up with things like even suggest, you know, like suggestions of things yes. because we just want to keep grabbing onto something again. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, and meditation uh -huh. uh, is, 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 is part of that. Like yeah. med meditation is the, is the grasping of the self onto the nothingness and mm. onto whatever it is. Yes. And, mm. um, yeah, and it's, it's go, well, meditation is the moment, is the that, instant, that is, is, it. Is, is it, there's no need to get out of wherever we are in order to be in meditation. Mm -hmm. Well, getting out of sleep helps. <laughs> Sorry? Getting in of sleep. Getting out of sleep. Getting out of sleep. <laughs> I was going in and out of, you know. And at the end, I just couldn't. I just couldn't focus at all. Yeah. You know. I mean, you're supposed to stay aware, and that's hard. Just to stay there, be present. But isn't that just another aspect of the mind, mind trying just to go. control itself? <laughs> yeah, to be focused yeah. is to be is to is to have is to seek control. And it's actually letting go of the need to even focus. Yes, which, indeed. Which so many of us have. Really where is the mind in that? Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, yes. But it's a bit like uh, climbing a mountain. Uh, <coughs> each step is useful in yes. a way, so yes, we yes. never know where yes. others are. Uh, we, we just have to know where we are. Yes. That's all, because yes. nothing is true, nothing is wrong. And no. Mm. Don't you find it interesting in this first story where the master says to the demon, you need not have worried, he belonged to you anyway, a seeming seeker after the divine who practiced these things and And the mind has to go back and go, now what was that he was doing? <laughs> Excellent question. What is the serious seeker? <laughs> what is the serious seeker? <laughs> exactly. discernment of the master who knew that this young seeker belonged to the demon. 
Dini. You need not have worried. <laughs> he belonged to you anyway. We have to have discernment too. Otherwise you'd have every Tom, Dick and Harry at your door. Seems like mm. there's bits and pieces that belong to different. <laughs> this is what we're on about, isn't it? Mm. It's not all one. No, no, no. Being bewildered is probably a very high state, but thank you, Marilyn.